Hmm, what's this? Oh dear, somebody's made a mistake. Let's investigate. Oh dear, not looking very stylish now, are you? Even worse, they've spilt their tea. Fish and chips everywhere. Tragic waste. Hello everybody, today you find me behind the wheel of a Porsche Taycan. The first and last time I got to experience one of these, it was a Taycan Turbo. Not quite the top end Turbo S, but near enough. With near 700 horsepower on tap, all wheel steer and just phenomenal grip, that was a car that really impressed me. So much so at the time I think I said I would have it over a 911, which I know to many may be sacrilege and in truth that's as much a damnation of the 911 as praise of the Taycan, but it was true. In the interim, I was also able to get my paws on the Audi version of the same thing, the RS e-tron GT, which in terms of value for money gives the Taycan a serious run because it offers turbo levels of performance for GTS levels of money. However, one of the big problems with all EVs is that for a quick couple of hours they are a riot, but we all know there's a lot more to them than just that. So I was keen to make sure that my next experience of a Taycan wasn't going to be quite so short term, and thanks to Porsche GB I've managed to make that happen because for the last week I've had this Taycan GTS on the driveway. Before we get started proper, one thing to mention, because there are a lot of things to talk about today, I've broken the video up into segments and I've done my best to try and keep them roughly ordered and if there's just one thing in particular you'd like to know about for example the driving experience or what it's currently like to live with an EV in Britain there are chapters for that so if you want to skip ahead to one of those I'll not hold it against you. So then, where to begin? Well, I suppose it would be sensible to start by explaining to you what exactly it is that I've been driving for the last week. This is a Taycan GTS Sport Turismo, and in Porsche tradition, they haven't exactly made the model lineup particularly easy to understand because you have a variety of different powertrain options and no fewer than three different body styles to choose from, and that's before you get into the options list. So, to explain to you a little bit more about this specific car, I'll hand you over to VoiceOver JM. Take it away. The range currently consists of three body styles and six powertrains. Not every trim is available with every body style, but the entry level car is called simply Taycan. It costs £79,200 before options and is the only one with two wheel drive courtesy of its single motor setup. The regular power output is 326 PS, which rises to 408 in overboost mode. Next up is the Taycan 4, with a pair of motors now giving it all-wheel drive and power rises to 380 by default with 476 in overboost. Then you have the 4S, which is 435 by default and 530 in overboost. With a starting price of just £10,000 over the base Taycan, Porsche predict that to be a popular option. Today I'm driving the GTS, which is next up in the hierarchy. It has 517 horsepower in regular mode, up to just shy of 600 in overboost, with 850 newton meters of torque, that's 626 pound foot, during launch control. Top speed is 155 mile an hour. It comes with a better standard options list versus the lower models, though as we'll see later, as it's a Porsche that doesn't really mean all that much, and it does cost a fair bit more. Prices today start at £110,000. The attention grabbing models are the range topping and daftly named Turbo and Turbo S. It's worth noting they both have the same power in regular driving mode, 625 PS, it's only in overboost where they differ, with the turbo having 680 horses on tap and the S 760 and considerably more torque too. Prices for the S begin at just shy of £150,000. 
The original Taycan shape is now called the Sport Saloon, but it has since been joined by two others. The car I'm driving today is the Sport Turismo, and is similar to the Panamera of the same name in that it's styled more like an estate, with the boot and cabin mixing together. Luggage capacity only rises by about 40 litres with the rear seats in place, but the Turismo gives you the ability to fold them for much greater stowage when required. Then you have the Cross Turismo. Based on the body style of the Sport Turismo, it features styling aimed to appeal to countryside drivers who want an optional higher ride height and more rugged looking bodywork, or town drivers who are intolerable cretins. So, that in a nutshell is the Taycan lineup. So, hopefully that is some of the fundamentals explained to you, and I'm very glad that this was the car the Porsche chose to give to me. The GTS in many of the model lines is seen as the real sweet spot. It offers a significant increase in terms of both performance and standard features over the regular car and the S, but isn't quite as pricey as the turbo variants. The only real exception seems to be in the Macan, where the GTS now is the top of the line, having replaced the old turbo. But here, it sits as with many others, pretty much smack bang in the middle. At that starting price of near £105,000, you wouldn't call this a cheap car, but then most EVs don't seem to be cheap, and you certainly wouldn't accuse this of being slow. Though it doesn't have the outright firepower of the turbo, it's still pretty rapid. However, if it's bang for buck that you're after, it cannot be argued that the Audi will give you more for less. And that's before you factor in the options list. Here in Britain, Audi don't really have much at all in the way of options, instead offering several trim levels, the top of the line being the Vorsprung. But Porsche take a more traditional approach. The advantage of this is that Porsche offers a much greater level of customization, and I have to say there are quite a few things that I'd want on a car that Porsche offer you and Audi don't. However, this does come at a cost, and in Porsche tradition, there is a lot on that options list that really should be standard. So, once again, I'll hand you over to VoiceOver JM to talk you through what's been added to this particular car. As you have probably noticed, this video was recorded a few months ago, and since then prices have changed, but here they are at the time the car was produced. The base price of the Taycan GTS Sport Turismo, £104,990. On top of that, this car has the Carmine Red paint for 1683 my personal favourite, the GTS interior package in Carmine Red, which ultimately seems to get you a little bit of Alcantara and some contrast stitching for £2,820. The electric folding exterior mirrors, another item that should just be standard in a 100 grand car, they're £210. Preparation for the rear bike carrier, £345. Rear axle steering, including power steering plus, that to me is an absolute must, and £1,650 actually well spent. Another item that should have been standard, the auto dimming exterior and interior mirrors, £294. The grey top tint for the windscreen, £80. Privacy glass in the rear, £354. Heads up display, 1128 The park assist with surround view, £522. 4 plus 1 seating arrangement, 336 The cabin ionizer, £203. Ambient lighting is 299 Four zone climate control, 581 The Bose surround sound system, 956 Preparation for Porsche rear seat entertainment, note, not the rear seat entertainment itself, £245. A 22 kilowatt onboard AC charger, £1,179. Mobile charger connect, honestly, not really sure what that is, £767. The first aid kit, 9 quid, and a tyre repair kit, £42. And that brings the total of today's car up to £118,693. Though with current pricing, it'd be closer, I think, to between 120 and 125. Starting to get pricey, isn't it? But you must remind yourself that a well-optioned 911 Carrera 4 S or GTS will cost you just about the same. And one thing they won't do is go down a road like this. As an object to cover ground at pace, the Taycan GTS is just as remarkable as its turbo siblings. 
These cars are neither small nor light, almost 5 metres and 2.3 tonnes, but to drive it, you just wouldn't think it. The rear wheel steer does make a tangible difference and to me, if you're a sporty driver or not, it's an essential option because when you're doing this sort of stuff, having a bit of fun, it makes the car a touch more lively, more agile and even when you're doing the less exciting stuff, it does make the car considerably more manoeuvrable. This in town is not anywhere near as bad as you might think up until the point you try to park it and you realise it's still quite a size this, at least here in Britain. Had you asked me before this week, I also would have said that it would be this body style, the Sport Turismo, that would be the one that would have the greatest appeal, because I'm a sucker for an estate or a shooting brake, and you'd imagine it adds a little bit of practicality to the Taycan. I think it's not a bad looking car, it certainly seems distinct enough from the Audi, but somehow the Audi wears the regular shape just that little bit better. The Sport Turismo and Cross Turismo, I suppose, do at least bring something novel to the party. However, if we were being fair, it is the kind of car you'd call striking rather than pretty. It's a good looking thing, not a great one. And that's absolutely fine. I think it's relatively successful. Unfortunately, on the interior front, I can't say quite the same thing because this just isn't good enough. I gave the turbo a similar battering when I drove that, and this really is no different. Take your pick of things like the cheap plastics that are on show in far too many places, to the bevy of screens which all look very impressive and futuristic, but on the whole are quite baffling. The dash layout, I don't actually mind, it works better than in a 911, however the twin screens here are just daft. At least this car has the good graces to have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, including wireless Android Auto, which the McCann and Cayman did not. However, this screen down here, this one for the HVAC and everything, it's daft. The bottom section of it you can use like a sort of trackpad to control the upper screen, and I do kind of like that. But I also sit here thinking, wouldn't just a sort of big dial that you can operate a la iDrive be better? Surely it would, would be more intuitive, would be easier and would stop you from getting your mucky greasy paw prints all over all the screens. It's just a disaster. And that's before we get on to the fact, and I know it's a, a very spec sensitive thing, of this car being in here just unrelentingly dull. This is something that has cropped up in the reviews of every single Porsche I've had for the last month. There have been four of them, the KN Turbo GT, the Cayman GT4 RS and the Macan T, and this is no different. This is how people are going to spec these cars, isn't it? Black leather, black Alcantara, a bit of contrast stitch, and this doesn't even have the panoramic roof that really would lift things. Combine that with the fact it's got privacy glass at the rear, and the back seats of this are not somewhere I want to spend any time. First off, there just isn't all that much room. I don't have particularly long legs. I'm five foot ten, but longer of torso than leg. And I can just about sit myself behind myself. I've got room, I'm not touching the seat, but I'm not far off. However, it's just bleak back there. And one weird thing about the Taycan that I didn't notice previously, because I only had to get in and out of it once essentially, is just how awkward it is to get into. Every single aperture in this car seems to be misaligned, like they put the door in the wrong place. This B pillar here is really big and chunky, and at the rear it's exactly the same. Getting in and out of the seats in this car is difficult, needlessly so. I took my elderly grandmother out in it the other day, and she was not impressed with this car. It was a real faff. You catch your knees on the edge of the dash here, which sticks out for no apparent reason, and it's all just a bit weird. The vents are not adjustable, and though you've got some funky menu settings which you can kind of use to do the same thing, why do we need to adjust the vents? in a menu. What was wrong with just grabbing the vent and pointing it where you wanted it? Surely that was the most intuitive thing you could have possibly done and um, adjusting it in the menu just doesn't work that well. It, it does not. Even little details like the fact that you've got your window switches and that down here and you've got your mirror switches as well and they're all level. They're all flat. They all kind of blend into one. It's, it's a disaster, the interior of this car. An absolute and total disaster and it does not feel the £100,000 car that it is. Well, £120,000 in fact. And do not get me started on the GTS interior bit. I'm sure VoiceOver JM's already told you about it, but oof, it makes my blood boil that. I do not know 
how poor sleep at night charging people near three grand for a GTS interior on a GTS. Well, actually, I know how they sleep at night on a very expensive bed, I assume. It is, of course, no surprise to hear that the Taycan is not anywhere near as interactive or engaging as a true sports car like the 911 or the Cayman. But I have to say, it does a much, much better job than you might expect. And the grip levels from this thing are absolutely immense. It's been pretty awful, the weather this week. I mean, truly, truly tragic. In some ways, it's been quite good because I've been able to experience the car in all conditions. And even when it's been fairly wet and cold, this car has managed to put power down in a way that I really, really didn't believe possible. I've actually tried to actively provoke it a few times and I haven't seen the traction control light flickering and it really has pushed you down the road. Quite sensational this. To get things wrong in a Taycan, I think, would require some considerable effort. It's not impossible. I have gone into a couple of bends and begun to feel the car protest, but also not anywhere near as soon as the RS e-tron GT, and that was a car I had in much fairer conditions. And when you've had your fun on the country lanes, like the Audi, the Taycan also makes an excellent motorway cruiser. It is reasonably refined, though not quite as supple as you might expect. It's still firm over those imperfections in the road. However, as with many an electric car, it's a fairly serene place to be. This car doesn't have double glazing, and I would option that if you can. One option I don't like, though, that the car does have is the Bose stereo. I'm not a really big fan of Bose in general, not many audiophiles are, but their in-car stuff is usually okay. This is embarrassingly bad, and that really surprised me because one of my all-time favorite in-car stereos was a Taycan, the Burmester, which is even more money, three and a half grand, but that felt like three and a half grand's worth. The Bose in here is just atrocious. The treble is indistinct, the mid just doesn't go through you like it should, and the bass is notable by its absence almost like it's trying to run from a really, really underpowered amp. It's just not good enough, Porsche, it really isn't. I expect better in a car of this caliber, especially when I've paid extra for the stereo. Mind, the Audi, weirdly, also wasn't that good on that front either. In terms of the dynamics, the major issue that I've had with the Taycan this week has actually been with the brakes. I don't know quite what's going on with this, and I cannot remember it being an issue in the turbo, but they do not instill confidence. They will stop the car, lean on them, and they'll really bring you to a halt. But that first inch or two of pedal travel is really quite disconcerting. It feels as if the car does, well, nothing. On more than one occasion, there has been a sense of a genuine panic. They're really not that good, and that's odd, because Porsche brakes often are some of my favourites. So then, in summary, the car is pretty good to drive. The steering is decent enough, not award-winning. The brakes, they're really not good, but I'm inclined to say there's something off with this particular car, perhaps, because the turbo didn't have that issue. The ride quality is very good. The stowage space is decent too. The boot is a really good size. Not amazing, but for a car like this, I think it can take more than enough stuff to deal with most usage scenarios. The rear seating arrangements aren't that great, though the interior effect can be improved by better specification. Get the panoramic roof, put some lighter materials in here, and it will be a lot better. Rear seat space is never going to be brilliant, but I suspect you'll be able to work out easily enough if it's good enough for you or not. Now, I must give special mention to Porsche GB because they knew with this car what I wanted to do was a more real-world, down-to-earth ownership piece. And so, to that end, they provided me with a Porsche charging card. And they said, James, here, take this, because if you bought a Taycan, you'd get this. And this has been one of my criticisms of many EVs. There are lots and lots of charging points around the country, more than ever, and some of them will do a deal. So if you buy a car from a certain manufacturer, you'll get much improved pricing. The most extreme example, perhaps being Ionity, who have a great network of very high power chargers. And there, if you don't have the card, you're paying near 70 pence a kilowatt hour, which is extortionate in case you weren't aware. However, with the charging card, 
it's 30p a kilowatt hour, so cheaper than what I pay at home, which is just over 40p a kilowatt hour. You buy a Taycan and you'll be given access to the Porsche charging network for three years, which you can then extend for a relatively modest fee, one that is certainly worth paying if you do any kind of mileage and need to charge away from home. It works with not just Ionity, but various other places too, including Porsche dealers, and in total, it gives you access to some 230,000 charging points. They even said to me, James, we'd like you to try the Porsche app as well, because you have a modern car, you can get an app with it, there's various things that you can do. And on occasion, the app has been very useful. It's basic, really, in terms of what it can do. You can lock and unlock the car. I don't believe it can be used as a key, as you can with some other manufacturers like Polestar, but it can do handy things like preheat or pre-cool the car. So I went shopping earlier in the week. It was absolutely miserable weather. It was about one degree and it was snowing, but as I was getting ready at the checkout, you get the app out, press preheat my car, so when you get to it, it's nice and toasty warm. That I really did appreciate. Oh, what an epic spot. You can also keep an eye on the car's charging status. It'll tell you how long it's going to be before it's done. I've got a wall-mounted charging point at home now, so I can charge a little bit quicker than I used to be able to, and that has been essential because living with an electric car is still not easy, and it's certainly not cheap. So before the sun sets and my batteries die, literally and spiritually, let's talk about that, because that is really the potential deal breaker for many, including me. It may be obvious to some, and less obvious to others, that EVs, like their combustion engine forebears, are not all built equal. And for a long time, there was a general idea that if you had an electric car, yes, it would cost you more initially to buy, but would be monumentally cheaper to run. And indeed, about five or six years ago, that was the case. I took a Kia e-Niro up to Scotland, chiefly because when I drove my first electric car, a lot of people said, well, what if you want to take it to Scotland? So I thought, let's do that. And sure, it took me about an hour or an hour and a half longer than it normally would have done. I had to make an extra stop, but it only cost me eight quid. That is quite a saving. Even the most parsimonious of combustion engine vehicles couldn't come close to that. But in the last five years, quite a bit has changed. We have a lot more charging points. They're better. There's more of them when they do appear, and they're generally a little bit denser, so you're rarely that far away from a proper charger. Five years ago, a fast charger meant 50 kilowatts. Today, 350 kilowatts. One of the strong points about the Taycan is that it can take a charge of 270 kilowatts, which is quite honestly staggering. That is a huge amount of electricity. This is a marvel of modern day engineering. But there is a pretty simple and fundamental problem. You see, EVs do still have fuel economy. They don't all burn the same amount of electricity doing the same thing. There doesn't really seem to be a universal consensus yet on which metric to use to measure your efficiency, but the one I've become attached to is miles per kilowatt hour, because it seems fairly easy to understand. You know how far you've gone, you know the price of a kilowatt, so you can work out how much you're paying, and therefore doing comparative maths becomes fairly easy. Now, when you're doing three to four miles per kilowatt hour, as you do in many a Tesla, the Kias, all that sort of stuff, you can achieve pretty darn good economy, and unless you're paying the absolute worst of electricity prices, you will still be doing better than were you driving a regular petrol or diesel. However, the Taycan does not do four miles per kilowatt hour. The Taycan does not do three miles per kilowatt hour. In fact, in the entire time that I've had it, the Taycan has averaged 2.1. And before you think that's because I'm a journo and therefore I've been hammering it at every given opportunity, that's just not true. The day I picked this up, well, actually, the night that I picked this up, I drove it the 100 or so miles home from Reading and it achieved an average of 2.1 miles per kilowatt hour. Meaning that despite the fact this has a fairly generously sized battery, 93 kilowatts or so, with about 83 kilowatts usable, the range, even with a completely full charge, is only about 220 miles. 
yes, the weather will almost certainly have been affecting it. It may be a little bit better in summer, but the fact is, we live in Britain. Well, I do anyway, I don't know about you, and here it is sort of five degrees for quite a bit of the year. So this, to me, just can't do the journey that I often do. Going to Silverstone and back for filming is about 200 to 230 miles, depending on which route that I take, whether there's traffic or a diversion or something like that. And to do that journey, I'd have to be starting with a full charge every single day. And even then I just about, just about get home. And this is problematic for several reasons. First off, it takes a long time to put charge in this car. If you have your average wall box, which will do, say, 7 kilowatts an hour, just over, but let's call it 7 for the sake of argument, that means that in an hour, the car only gets about 14 miles of range. And so, to get a full charge into it takes a very long time indeed, far more than the four hours that you're given if you have cheap rate electricity courtesy of somewhere like Octopus Go, which all your evangelists love to talk about. Fact is, to charge this car has taken me, at several points, about 12 to 15 hours, and that's off the faster home charging socket. And naturally, bigger battery, more kilowatt hours, worse efficiency means it's more expensive too. Not only will you spend longer at the pump, you'll pay more for it as well. Depending on where you go, filling this car up could cost you anywhere from, well, potentially nothing, to about 60 quid. And that's for your 200-ish miles of range. That's just not good. This week, I have spent about £200 on electricity. And before you say, yeah, what you mean, James, is that uh, Porsche have spent £200 on you swanning around in their Taycan. No, I don't. On the Porsche app that they give you, you also have a map that will show you where all the charging stations are that will work with the Porsche card. And there isn't a single one within 25 miles any direction of where I live. So I thank you very kindly for lending me the charging card Porsche, but I regret to inform you I haven't actually spent a penny on it. Not because I didn't want to, but because I physically wasn't able to. At no point in time was a charger that worked with the Porsche card even remotely close to where I was going to be, and I wasn't going to drive an hour out of my way just to get some slightly cheaper electricity. I don't have that amount of time on my hands. In case you're wondering how this compares with a regular combustion engine vehicle, if you're paying about £1.50 for your fuel, which is a guideline price for super unleaded, which is what I tend to use, you'd be doing the equivalent of about 30 mpg in here. So, for the performance on offer, it's very good. And I must at this point remind you that much of my moaning now is not Taycan specific. All EVs will experience reduced performance in winter. A combination of online articles with scientific research and anecdotal tales from industry friends tells me that in summer conditions I could expect up to 20% better range from the car, which would make a big difference to me, both in terms of practicality and cost. My journeys are also mostly motorway, which for an EV are actually the worst case scenario. If your usage is primarily around town, then the range will rise dramatically and costs fall accordingly. In addition, though charging at home does take a while, the incredible performance of the Taycan's battery pack means that at a suitable charging point, you can take the car from almost empty to 80% in about 20 minutes. It also seems fair to mention that although there definitely isn't a Porsche network charger anywhere near my house, I did double check after this review, I do live in the sticks, and on my major route that I take to Silverstone, I do pass four high-speed charging stations which are on the Porsche network. EVs are very interesting, they're very exciting, I'm really looking forward to how they develop, but our week with one has shown me that still we're a very, very long way from them being an acceptable mainstream solution. This is a car for posh company directors to swan about because they're likely going to buy it through the firm so they don't really pay much for it at all. They'll write it off against tax. They pay currently no benefit in kind, though that will be changing, and I'm sure they'll convince the directors that they need to put a charging point in so they can all get that nice environmentally friendly electricity, but what they actually mean is that um, they're just going to bill the firm for it so they don't have to pay for it. And I suppose you could say that a lot of this really isn't the Taycan's fault. Porsche don't set the price for charging points, other than the ones that they own, but they did build this car. And I just 
don't know how they managed to get the economy in it as bad as they have. Because were this car that did three miles per kilowatt hour, that's 50% of an improvement, so a, a big ask, but others manage it, this would be a whole different thing. To the point, I'd maybe be thinking about buying one, but as it stands, it's just not ready for me, and I'm not ready for it. But we must remember, it's a first effort, and as first efforts go, it's not that bad, really. So there we go, that's a look at the Porsche Taycan GTS Sport Turismo. What did I leave out? I'm sure there must be something. Please hop into the comment section down below, tell me, and I'll do my best to answer you. But for now, I want to say a big thank you to Porsche GB for lending me the car, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.